and welcome back to Skipper Sandra. I'm your skipper, Sandra, and this is very exciting. So I've been telling you guys that I was going to do this, that we were going to do this. We've had some delays, but it's happened. And I am so excited to introduce you all to Christina Harkness. Uh, we're gonna talk about that coral reef project that I've been wanting to tell you about and kind of alluded to. Well, there's no more alluding, we're doing. So I am just gonna turn it over to Christina and uh, I'm, thank you, I'm so excited. <laughs> this is fabulous. Um, I'd like to start off with where, where you come from with, with all of this, with the whole ocean and fiber arts and all of that. How did that all come about? Well, the fiber arts came before the ocean, but not by much. Um, I started knitting, probably I self-taught when I was maybe eight or 10 years old. Um, I was a very stubborn kid and I wanted to, nobody in my, I didn't know anybody who knit, but I found a learn to knit Coates and Clark little pamphlet mm -hmm. thing from like the fifties where everything is acrylic and terrible. Um, and I wanted to do that. And so I was showing my aunt that raised me you know, I want to do this teach me how do I do this and she's like nah you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get any yarn or you know that you you'll just quit you know it'll just be a waste of money so because I was a stubborn kid and I wanted to show her that she was wrong somebody said no yeah exactly I was opp oppositionally defiant um, so I got some garden twine and some sharpened pencils and I started teaching myself how to knit so that's how I learned how to knit um, and it wasn't too long after that um, I, I was a kid raised on Jacques Cousteau. Mm -hmm. um, my second grade teacher was really into showing any time, any rain day that we can go out for recess. It was always Jacques Cousteau, you know, the, on the, the reel to reel projectors right. in your, in your Girl. school room and totally got me hooked on that. And so, um, you know, for my birthday growing up, I remember getting, um, a card for Greenpeace, you know, getting a membership mm -hmm. in Greenpeace and, so it was always something that was important to me. And um, I really didn't kind of marry the two thoughts up until um, I joined the Merchant Marine. And so I sailed around the world, sailed on uh, 1,000 foot liquefied natural gas tankers. And one of the things that really struck me was, uh, you know, when we would be coming into a harbor and I would be on the bow watch, I would be standing at the bow of this huge ship, looking down at the ocean. So you guys know the bow is the front of the ship? Oh, yeah, enough. sorry. <laughs> yeah, the front part, so you know. the pointy part in the front. Um, looking down at the ocean and, you know, all I saw was just the, the surface of the water was nothing but plastic containers and garbage. And, and when was this? This was in the late 80s, early 90s. So guys, to, just to put a framework to this, we're talking, today is 2022 and we're talking late 80s this has been building mm -hmm. you know so it, it's important to really get that idea and and to really you know i mean i have to take ownership of the fact that i worked in a job where in the merchant marine it i feel that it probably still happens it's not supposed to happen now but once you're out of the purview of people watching what you're doing cats away the mice will play exactly um, you know, they would dump garbage into the sea. You know, that's how they would get rid of their garbage. Okay. And so it was, it was horrifying. I mean, and, and to see that firsthand and know where, where that was happening, you know, and, and to see the effects of it was just, it, it ripped, wow. you know, this, this little, uh, Greenpeace, uh, membership card, uh, Jacques Cousteau girl, um, just ripped my heart out. Yeah. And so, um, it was when I started really when I started crocheting which I, I I've been knitting since I was a kid but not crocheting not um started maybe 15 years ago or so something and like what that. brought that on wanting to create coral forms <laughs> so I saw I saw that and and you know it's yes you can do it in knitting mm -hmm. but it's easier to do it in crochet and so you know really starting to see see the world like oh i'd like to really create this certain shape even if it wasn't a coral form just something in the world um i used to do brains and hearts and intestines i did a whole <laughs> gi track once anyway so doing weird things um but realizing that it's a lot easier to create some of those shapes in crochet than it is in knitting 
so I just taught myself how to crochet. Um, but but it was wanting to, to start to just create coral forms and kind of marry that love of the ocean with fiber arts. And then when the Google came around and discovering, going online like, oh, I've just you know created this whole art form of my own, and then was like, oh no, I haven't. <laughs> Other people have paved the way. But so. it's that great cosmic consciousness yeah. that we have, you know, yeah. that need that we all have of those that become aware of what's going on around us, that it, it spurs that that heart, that art form yeah. for everybody, but in different ways. I mean, just because, and this is something that I always talk about with, with my viewers, is that um, what you do is always different from everybody else, mm -hmm. even though you're using maybe the same pattern. Mm -hmm. It will always be different because it's handmade. So how cool is that? That is amazing. And it's really fun. And so <laughs> that took you onto this, to these art forms. What brought you to this project? Um, you know, really being inspired by the Institute for Figuring and the Wertheim sisters that, that initially came up with the idea to marry um, the hyperbolic geometric shapes with um, ocean conservation. And so they lived in Australia, they wanted to, you know, it was uh, right at the beginning of um, when the uh, Great Barrier Reef started bleaching. Oh, right. And so, um, one of the sisters is a physics teacher and so she she simply wanted to use these hyperbolic crocheted forms to just show her students this is these are the concepts i'm trying to tell you about and then her sister was the one that looked at it and said that really looks like a coral and so that was sort of like the lightning moment that they realized that they could create all of these different coral shapes and forms and create a really a worldwide kind of community project where everybody could create a piece or, or more to donate to it. And so that became the, the Institute for Figuring's Crochet, um, or I should just say Fiber Art um, Satellite Reef Project. And that's the biggest community art project in the world. Wow. So real quick for those that don't know, what is hyperbolic? It is, um, it, it's something that occurs in nature more often um, than anywhere else. And so when you are wanting to, like in, a, in an animal in nature, um, sometimes animals will want to have more surface area so that they, if they're using their surface area to maybe um, for breathing mm -hmm. or for taking in nutrients, so they want as much surface area as possible to be able to breathe or eat. Um, and so they develop um, basically ruffled kind of ruffle edges um, and it's it's you're going around in circles and you're increasing maybe in every single stitch or every second stitch third stitch um, however you want to do it but what it does is creates a lot more surface area in a small space uh -huh. and so it was kind of funny with the the Wertheim sisters um, you know they had wanted to I guess physicists had wanted to kind of be able to demonstrate this hyperbolic um, mathematics or geometry, but they didn't know how. And they were just like, oh, it's this theoretical concept. Um, and it just took one physicist that happened to crochet to say, you could do this in crochet and demonstrate these principles. So for all of you who don't like math, guess what? <laughs> it's everywhere. And, and what's really cool is that you don't have to be a huge mathematician and you don't have to be a great crocheter. I mean, it's it, it can look intimidating, but it's not. It's a simple... And that's what I was going, if you don't mind me yeah. taking it for a second. So if you guys look at this, I mean, and the base is just very simple. And I could probably find, there it is. There, and I can see it better than you guys can. But it's just a, a circle, right? The middle, right? And this is what we always talk about. It's sip. all crocheting is is a loop on a hook. <laughs> and how you connect those loops is what you're going to get. How many of you have tried to do a scarf and you were doing a straight edge and got the ruffle, right? And that's really what you're holding <laughs> and you're manipulating. I'm thinking, 
That that reminds me of my first scarves. For some people, they would say, "Well, I made a terrible mistake," <laughs> right. and it's not. It's it's something of beauty. So what an what an awesome. So next time you see a ruffled edge on a project, just go, "Oh, I'm thinking of the ocean." Yes. There we go. Look, I'm doing hyperbolic geometry. Right. <laughs> right. That is awesome. So are these all pieces that you've created? Um, a, a lot of the, these here are. Um, this one was. There was a, a lovely lady that came in this morning because um, we've been having people donate pieces from all over the world, actually. Um, but what's really, really cool is when I get to meet the people that are making them. And this morning, one of the ladies brought her mom and her elderly mom, and she's been making just a ton of these, and they've been dropped off here, and I got to meet her this morning. So it was, it was really cool. And a lot of what I brought today, I purposefully brought things that aren't hyperbolic shapes simply because I wanted to show kind of the wide variety of things that you can make. So, so in, in talking about what to make, um, so you're looking for, what, from what you're saying, is not just the hyperbolics, mm -hmm. not just the coral, but everything else. How is that going to play into this installation? Well, what's really interesting, I was just talking to a person who is working on a reef um, in another place in the country, um, and they're partnering with the Institute for Figuring, and we're not. This is a this is a separate project here in the Pacific Northwest, and so, <laughs> so with the Institute for Figuring, what they have requirements is that it can only be corals. They don't want any light, you know, any animals or anything. It's all corals because they want you to concentrate strictly on what's happening on the coral reefs. And I wanted to take a kind of a broader look at it because the coral reef is not, it's, it's not by itself. 25% mm -hmm. um, of all of marine life relies on coral reefs. And so I think it's important to show, yes, the coral reef, but also to show the animals that rely on the coral reef. And so um, we're telling people that you can make anything that you want as long as it's real, so no mermaids. Um, and, and uh, you know, any animals, it doesn't have to be like, uh, you know, oh, well, this species is only pink and you made a purple one. It's how dare you? Nope, we're, we're not worried about that. So you can make whatever colors you want. Um, something that I do, actually, when I'm just looking for inspiration, I just Google image coral reefs and just look at things and go, okay, well, that's a shape I can make. And So I, like I see here, we've got check this guy out. He's, I, I just, you guys know, I love my whales. Um, and, and obviously, three-dimensional whale here. Is he going to be, or she, please, I don't mean to be disparaging here, um, are we going to be putting them all just on a two-dimensional table, or are these going to be hanging? I'm just, hoping to have some hanging, and I'm hoping, because, you know, that's one thing that people are asking is, like, well, what, let's look at scale. You know, we've got, we've got uh, you know, right. a crab that is as big as the whale. Okay, so in my mind, um, what I'm hoping to do is that, you know, we can put the whale somewhere where it looks like it's farther away. Way. Right. You know, just kind of perspective. Work, work, to work get a perspective. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. So you guys can see all of this. And it's okay if I just go ahead and grab okay. some stuff. Check this jellyfish out. So I, I, I'm in love with jellyfish too. And this, I'm in love with anything that's the ocean actually. But isn't this great? And they've added lights. Is this, this one of yours? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They added this, the, the lights onto it. So I just think this is amazing. And here we have different textures. We've got, this is eyelash lay, um, uh, yarn here that that's what that fuzzy stuff that you're seeing there so we've got a definite mix of materials so, so open open your creativity and just go don't let it stop you really fun with the fairy lights because um, that's a remote control jellyfish <laughs> and so um, you can hit the remote control and make the lights flash different th different ways and so all that is is just getting a strand of the fairy lights from your local hobby store and just crocheting around the fairy lights mm -hmm. and then just attaching them as tentacles so so my library at home i it just happened by accident that i started I, people started giving me jellyfish mm -hmm. and i started hanging them from my ceiling so i have these jellyfish all kinds of jellyfish from all all kinds of different materials jellyfish i've made jellyfish other people have made uh, all kinds of pla i mean all kinds of things so i ha but i don't have any with fairy lights i will have yeah, to have fairy have lights now 
very light. <laughs> so one of the things we're talking about microplastics, um, or we haven't talked about it yet, but I'm bringing it in. Uh, the microplastics and the plastics that are in the ocean. Uh, we do know that now babies have been born with microplastics in their blood, uh, which we don't know what the effects that's going to have on uh, the genetics and everything. But as a fiber artist, as we all are, we use yarns that are available. A lot of us use yarns that are acrylic, and I can tell you right now, yeah. this is, for instance, acrylic. A lot of acrylic. this is acrylic, yeah. Um, how do we reconcile that? Because we want to be, we want to be responsible. Right. We want to be, uh, we don't want to add to the problem, but yet we have this here. What do we do? You know, I, I want to look at it in the um, respect of reduce, reuse, recycle. And so reducing our reliance on plastics of any kind in our life is, is the goal. Um, but when we have acrylic yarn, you know, I also want to make this project uh, accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. And yes, I love to work with wool, that's my gig, but not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be someone that says, you know, well, then you can't participate. You know, mm -hmm. so that's to me that's very elitist. Um, we have yarn. No that's yarn been, <laughs> We have yarn that's been donated, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes I'll go to estate sales or to um, the consignment shops and stuff, and, and find nice nice acrylic yarn. And you can find nice acrylic yarn, um, but it's I'm not buying it firsthand. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a part of the uh, reuse and recycle thought right you know that yarn exists in the universe I am not making a um, any I'm not increasing the need for companies to make more of that yarn but I am using what's there mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I have to justify it right right um, so in order to do the donations um, are uh, how are you handling that are they mailing it in do they have to bring it in physically nope. what's the the setup for that. Um, so on my website, uh, you can go and... I'll have all of that in the description <laughs> down below. Um, you can just drop me a line. I don't want to have my physical mailing address on online, um, but just drop me a line and say, you know, I've got my donations ready. Where do I send it? Um, and then I'll just let you know what the address is and you can mail it in from anywhere. You can also drop it off at the Eugene Textile Center in Eugene, Oregon. Um, you can drop it off at Teaselwick wools in Salem, Oregon, and I'm working on getting maybe a site in Portland where people can drop things off, but that's not firmed up yet, so. Okay. When, and when you're, t for those of us that are here in the Portland area, what are you looking for as far as a drop-off site? Um, preferably uh, a yarn store or something, mm -hmm. someplace with higher traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, that, uh, you know, big, the store big enough to accommodate a place where people can drop it off and it's not going to be a nuisance because I don't want to be a nuisance to the business owners. So, um, yeah, just some place that would be willing to host that. All right, you guys, you got your mission. You know, try to see if you can find something. That would be awesome. Uh, and is, so is this going to be something that's going to be open to the public? Um, how is this going once the installation? Well, let's talk about the dates first. So when is every the last donations to be in. So this, we are planning on this being a traveling exhibit. Oh. So, um, which is a, a, another reason why we wanted to have it as our own project rather than a part of the Institute for Figuring is that we wanted to keep control of everything. <laughs> Not to say I'm a control freak, but anyway. Um, we don't know anybody like that. <laughs> so, for this, for this project in this space, um, we're saying at the end of August 2023, because the project or the installation will open in September 2023. And so um, we'd like to have everybody that wants to be on board with that installation have it in by August. Um, we're going to have another installation in Salem in 2024. Um, so, you know, if people are still sending things in after that. It'll just go into the next ex exhibit, but uh, we would like to get everything in. So we have all of, as big of an installation as possible. Right, so yeah. you can fill the space. Now, <clears throat> once the whole process is over, the, and well, how long is it gonna, because you're talking about Salem, <laughs> so is it gonna travel somewhere else after that? Are, we, are yep. there plans for that? Um, I hope to, I'm reaching out. Um, what I would love is to be at an aquarium. 
Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the one thing that the the gals at the Institute for Figuring have discovered, and I have I can confirm that it's true for me as well, is that you know the fiber community is really excited about a project like this, but the science science community not so much. It it oh. you know I've got a few um, people who are marine biologists that are creating things, but when I approach aquariums or scientific institutions and say, hey, would you, you know, it's free. Would you like to have this in your space? No, that's okay. And, and, it, and it makes me very sad. Yeah. So um, I'm still trying. I'm still reaching out. You know, I would love to big time Seattle Aquarium. Let's have a, let's have an right. exhibit there. So um, what I'm hoping is that once we get the installation here and I can get it professionally photographed, then I'll have the the backing to right. show this is what it could be mm -hmm. you know can we come and play oh what a great so any of you that work for any aquariums <laughs> or have friends or family put the bug yep. i mean we got to we've got to share this and get this um i'd really like to talk a little bit about what's going on with the corals uh, for those of you who haven't seen it it's called Ch i believe it's in netflix it's chasing corals chasing corals. um wow it, it tore me apart uh, to see it. So you need to be in the headspace for it, just like Blackfish. I'm just throwing that in because of my own love for orcas. But uh, yeah, you've got to be in the in the headspace for it because it will tear you apart. But if you could talk a little bit about what that bleaching is, because I don't think enough people know what that means. Yeah. So um, back in the late 90s is when it really started to hit the Great Barrier Reef that was sort of the canary in the coal mine mm -hmm. and what it all comes down to is um, as the oceans are warming and as um, they're absorbing more CO2 from emissions in the atmosphere um, the oceans are becoming more acidic and they're becoming hotter and corals cannot handle that temperature mm -hmm. change. Um, what makes a coral have color is uh, little actually little creatures inside of the um, polyps of coral, little al algal creatures. And so it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. the, the coral plant needs, coral animal needs to have that algae inside of it because the algae is what feeds it. Mm -hmm. And so they work together and everybody's happy. Um, when the temperatures of the water get too warm, it expels that algae. And so it, it's basically expelling what gives it color. Oh. And so then the corals, and, and a great part of our installation will be talking about bleached corals. And so then corals turn white, like this. And so if you go on a Google image search and you just look up bleached coral reef, you can see um, just a once beautiful, colorful reef like this, and everything will be white. And that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the coral is dead at that time. Um, it can recover, um, but it, the environment has to change. Uh -huh. And so you'll see these bleaching events, they used to um, happen every few years uh, where the, the water would get real warm, the corals would bleach, um, eventually the water would cool down a little bit, the al algae would be uh, coming back and the corals would start to recover. Um, and if it takes a few years between these bleaching events, then the corals can recover um, but what's happening now is that it's happening every year. And oh, so, so there's no recovery time. There's no recovery time. And then the corals will die. And much like the rainforest, I mean, the coral reef is, is basically the rainforest in the ocean. Right. And so we need uh, coral reefs. Uh, they provide us with protection, especially when sea levels are rising. Um, you know, coastal communi communities, we've got the Pacific Ocean right outside the window here. Coastal communities um, that have coral reefs protecting them, uh, the, the coral reef is there as kind of a wall, a natural wall against like ocean is the storm, storm surges. And so it protects the communities behind it. And it also provides, you know, millions and millions of dollars in tourists um, visiting the, the beauty of the coral reefs. And uh, like the rainforest, the um, coral reefs have medicinal properties that we're just learning about you know different um different plants different animals that can provide human beings with medicine and that's one i didn't know yeah 
And so, you know, it's like when they say, oh, they just discovered a new species in the rainforest and, you know, we never knew about it. And what do you know? It, it does this for cancer. Um, it's the same way on the coral reefs. And so, you know, all of these things that are benefiting humanity um, through the coral reef uh, are all the things that are going to be in, under threat. And especially when you think about marginalized communities around the world where these coral reefs are, you know, we as um, people who, of privilege who can come into areas, um, you know, bring our tourist dollars, pollute the area, you know, do, you know, harmful activities to these coral reefs, and then we leave. And then the people in that area are, have to live with the consequences, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they can't help the fact that the ocean is rising. And so, you know, we have to think globally in this, this whole thing. And it's not just, oh, you know, if you live in Hawaii or if you live in Australia, you should be worried about this. It's like, you know, as citizens of the world, we need to be worried about this. Right. Now, in that uh, program, they were talking about scientists are starting to grow mm -hmm. corals. So are they, just out of curiosity, if you know, are they going back to the Great Barrier Reef to where it's bleaching and trying to help it recover faster? Yep, they're trying to, um, what they're, they're selectively breeding. And there's, a, there's actually breeding. Aside from um, chasing coral, there's a, a documentary called Finding Atlantis that was put out by, and I don't know if it, it, it was put out in, by OSU, was it? I, I think I, I've seen that one. Anyway, um, so it's a really good documentary as well. And that, that talks about selective breeding of corals. And so what they're doing is they're trying to breed the most uh, temperature hardy corals mm -hmm. and then they take those back out to the reefs and plant them there hoping that they'll be able to survive and so that's a whole way that they're you know boots on the ground combating right. what's happening to corals right them. now yeah okay all right um, so then once, so coming back to the installation, I, let's bring this up because this just <laughs> breaks my heart. So coming back to this great installation that we're going to have so much fun with, once the, the installation, once it's done, you know, you've put it in, a, uh, in an aquarium, I'm sure they're only going to have it for so many years or whatnot, what happens to all the pieces? Um, well, that's going to be something that we'll have to figure out. We haven't figured it out yet. We haven't okay. figured out yet. Okay. Yep. All yep. right. Wonderful. And for those people who actually participate and have the opportunity to come in, because you said that you're getting pieces from all over the world. Mm -hmm. How fun is that? Where have you gotten pieces from? Um, well, we've gotten uh, people that are making things in the UK, um, in Poland. I, I had somebody contact me from the Ukraine right before the war broke out, and they, oh, were, wow. they were like, oh, we want to we do this. I haven't heard from them since. So I'm, Pray for I'm, them. I'm thinking that they probably got a lot more important yeah. things on their minds. Yeah. So, um, but all across the United States, I just got a big box in from from Minnesota, which I'm originally uh, from the Midwest. Lived in Minnesota for about 20 years, so it was nice to nice to see somebody representing from Minnesota. So, right. Yeah, it was very cool. So, have you gotten? This is kind of fun. Um, have you gotten like pretty much? Every state represented starting to get represented. That'd be fun to have. I that. haven't. I haven't. That would be okay. very okay. Cool. All right. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, like Alaska. We, we got Let's get some people from Alaska. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. I that'd was thinking fun. about that the other day. Yeah, that'd be very fun. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. This is just an. Uh, uh, so I brought my first <laughs> donation, my own uh, num 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 um, to the. Uh, to the thing, and you guys all, all know about, I'm big on trying to reuse again. So this was a pattern you can find online. I will have it in the description. Very easy, super easy, quick to make. Um, but, you know, again, reusing, yeah, to ke help keep it stay, you know, using a toilet paper roll. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will post it on there. So again, try to think of those things that you have that you might put into your recycling, um, how that can translate into um, a one of our people. Excellent. Oh, I love it. I love it. Let's put it right down front. Very cool. And again, that was done with uh, worsted weight yarn, and I combined the top with the uh, eyelash lace or eyelash um, yarn to make that fuzzy type of topping to it. Uh, this has been amazing. I cannot wait to see this just flourish more. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you could advise us to to help spread the word to get this out there um get our communities excited about it you know what if if this is something that's interesting for you i would say go to your local yarn shop 
and see if I have a flyer on my website that you could download and see if you can hang up a flyer at, the, at your local yarn shop. Um, you know, if people get really excited at your local yarn shop, you know what, let's see if they could put out a, a donation box and people can just, you know, make stuff and put it in there and when it's full they can send it off. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool, um, the Wertheim sisters have said this online too, it's similar to how a coral reef is created by millions of little tiny animals make uh -huh. this huge, huge um, uh, ecosystem. Uh, it's the same with this project, you know, a whole bunch of people each making a small amount makes a, a beautiful installation. How, what a great way to think about that. I mean, we can mimic, and that's our, how society is anyway. It's just a bunch of people, you know, little pieces that we come together and we all share something different, a different perspective, a different way of doing something, and we create the color. We create the color and we create the culture, and this is just something so important. You guys all know I am huge when it comes to the ocean. Um, this, the great Pacific island, plastic island, mm -hmm. that we need to get uh, under control. You know, it's all it's all by one, and and I, I know it can get overwhelming. I know I get overwhelmed when I start thinking about everything that's going on. You know, I see these programs. And it's just like, well, what can I do? I mean, it's just me, but it's just me. And then it's just you, now we're two. And then somebody else, now we're three. And so it's not just you. It, it, you're not alone in this. We can do this together, but it does have to be together. Yeah. And as fiber artists, what an amazing way to be able to bring that to light and have it shine and have fun in the process because uh, we're getting to do what we love to do. Yes. You know, and here's uh, just a quick, tip if you're going out to the uh, secondhand stores or you're going to estate sales i do that a lot <laughs> um when you get your yarn even if it looks a little <laughs> get old uh, knee-high nylon stockings you put the whole one skein at a time or dismantle skein however it works but one in each one tie a knot in it and you can wash it that way and dry it that way Oh, nice. Yeah, so that makes it, it it's, because I've had a lot of people ask, you know, well, how do you wash yarn? <laughs> you know, if you go buy it, because you don't know. If you go to a secondhand store, if you buy it uh, from an estate sale or garage sale, you don't know what's been on it. And you might want to do it, especially if you have allergies or anything like that. You want to be able to take care of your own family, too. So that's a great way of doing that. And you can keep those nylon stockings. Don't throw them away, because if you undo the knot, don't cut it off. Try to undo it. That way you can go back and do that again. And again, we can reuse this yarn that's already out there. I do a packet because we'll make it too little itchy. <laughs> so I'll pack it's one of my favorites. All right, well, this has been wonderful. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Because I, I I could just sit here all day. <laughs> well, one of the things also, um, aside from the, the bleaching, the coral bleaching, is we also want to just, like we had mentioned earlier about the plastics in the ocean, um, we also want to talk about um, like ghost nets that are in the ocean, right. abandoned fishing gear. And so I didn't bring it with me today, but I have like a, a an actual uh, net that I, uh, I think that one I knitted out, out of plastic yarn. And so, you know, if people want to create things um, to talk about the entanglements or the uh, abandoned gear in the ocean and have that be a part of the display, that's great too. You know, we that's a great that. point. Right. Um, you know, because just, just what, a couple days ago, they had a sperm whale that, that washed up a young sperm whale. It was just uh, full of plastics. And that's, it died of malnutrition because it had all of these plastics and, and gear and stuff in its stomach and it couldn't eat anymore. Right. And so, you know, that's, this display, it's not just about um, the, the, the health of corals, but it, it also touches about the health of our oceans. Right, because it all affects it. It all affects it, it's all tied together. Um, and so yeah, that's a point, great point to remember. You don't have to do the colorful stuff. Uh, you can take it from the other side. And, and I think that's what part yeah. of the plan is to do that progression, either yep. one way or the other. And so we want to, um, and, and that's something that it's, I have a, a big display of the bleached reef that I'm working on as all as one piece. But I have to be in a headspace for it. Right. Because it's the same as sitting down and watching Chasing Coral. It's like, if you're not in the right headspace, it's so depressing and so sad. Um, but, uh, you know, 
inspiring people to also work on bleached pieces. Um, you know, any, any whites, it, it, blacks even, you know, uh, if you're making black coral forms, you can, that, to me that talks about pollution in the ocean. Uh -huh. um, and so that's welcome, you know, any, anything like that. So um, a lot of people like to do the beautiful, colorful stuff, but right. the whole mission is to communicate the health of the ocean and the health of the reefs. So. That is awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I, this is beautiful. So that you all know what I'm also going to do is down at the bottom, I will be putting my P.O. Box address. So if you want to send any of your uh, donations, I can obviously, I can come um, and drop them off. So you can just send those directly to me and I will bring those to you. I think it's uh, an amazing thing. And I would ask, I, that this isn't part of uh, the program, but for us, for our community, if you send those pieces to me, please put your name because yes. I'd love to give you a shout out. Um, for and I'd like and before I donate them, I, I want to be able to show all of us, you know, what we're all doing because it's so much fun. You yep. know, that whole it, we're art, we're artists, but we also have a heart for what's going on around us, and we need to remind each other and, and boost each other up when we're doing that. And that's something that we want to have at our installation is a list of everybody that that creates. Um, that wants to be acknowledged, we want to have their name there. So. Okay, so then I'll be yep. adding that to that. So, <laughs> you know, let me know, give me that so that I can share that with you because I, I want to be able to have, um, facilitate this as much as I can as well. Again, I, this is just, wow. I get spent <laughs> all day um, with you because this is the, the artwork, and you should really see some of her artwork. It's just like, oh my gosh. Like, just, <laughs> I have something to aspire to. Not that I didn't, but I mean, I have more to aspire to. A beautiful, beautiful pieces. Thank you again. Thank it's you. been great. It's been I, very fun. I can't wait to see this grow, and um, hopefully we can tag again yeah. as things progress. Oh, you know what? I never asked you about how this is going to come together. Like, are you going to be asking people to... Do you have a crew that's going to put it all together, or are you going to be asking people to come in? And yeah, have a crew? I, I can envision asking for volunteers uh, when the time rolls around. I can envision, uh, you know, joining. <laughs> I can envision that. Perfect. All right, that is exciting. So again, if you're in the Portland area um, or down here in the coast area, we are in Lincoln City. We are in the. Um, Lincoln this City Cultural Center. Cultural Center, but this specific room is the, the Fiber Arts studio. or the Textile mm -hmm. Studio. Uh, but we are in Lincoln City. It's going to be here in Lincoln City. Uh, so if you're in the coastal region, of course, you know, here you are as well. You know, come, uh, come out and check it out and see what's going on. All right, Christina. Well, thank you again so much for everything that you've done. You. I know this is like the third or fourth time that I've thanked you, <laughs> but I just can't. I, can you tell I don't want to go? I really don't. Um, it's fabulous. All right, everyone, as always, keep on stitching. Remember, crocheting is nothing more than just a loop on a hook, and how we combine it is what we create. All right, have a great time. Bye-bye, everyone.